Okay, so welcome everybody to the last session, I believe, for today. So we're ha very happy that Peter Eckersley could make it. Um, that's uh, one of the positive things that the CCC camp happened at the same time. So uh, he was anyway there and he agreed to drop by to give his talk on the Let's Encrypt. He's the chief computer scientist from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So please welcome Peter Eckersley. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that we've been doing at EFF and the University of Michigan and Mozilla for the last couple of years. And the aim is to issue free certificates automatically using an automated protocol so all of those uh, things that are currently not encrypted uh, can be encrypted. Um, obviously, the web is great. Uh, HTTP has done very well. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing service to humanity but it's not good enough anymore. Uh, we know that the HTTP protocol is completely structurally insecure. You can't do anything uh, with it that um, is private uh, or protected or authenticated, basically, uh, and so we need to do better. Uh, we've been campaigning on this issue at EFF uh, for about the last five or six years. The first thing we did is we started uh, just talking to big companies. We went to Google and we said, can you please make uh, a version of search that is encrypted. And they said, oh, we'll think about it. And then they came back to us one day and said, we're actually going to offer an optional version of search that you can uh, use over HTTPS. And so to celebrate that, we launched a browser extension called HTTPS Everywhere. And then we went and we started hassling Facebook and Twitter during the Arab Spring and Wikipedia. Uh, and gradually, these companies either made HTTPS an option if it wasn't before or uh, have now largely uh, gone to HTTPS by default, which is great. Uh, we're making good progress. Um, but unfortunately, we're not done yet. Uh, there are huge, I mean, maybe the people in this room don't use Bing, uh, but there are huge parts of the web that are used by hundreds of millions of people uh, that are uh, HTTP, completely insecure, vulnerable to uh, surveillance or hacking by default. Um, news websites, in particular, are a disaster. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the mixed content blocking problem, which has uh, bedeviled efforts by news sites to, to upgrade to HTTPS. Uh, but sometimes, of course, the things you choose to read, whether it's on a news site or some other site, uh, can be quite sensitive, revealing the information, the records about what topics you're paying attention to uh, should be private, and it's not private on the web today. Um, so whether you're reading about uh, Amazon's business practices or you're reading books on Amazon, you'll be doing that over HTTP. Um, even Google, which largely has been a leader in this space, uh, still has, um, still has uh, um, large amounts of its site, especially on the ad side of things, which are not encrypted by default. Now, you might, uh, you might uh, think that this sign-in button here is inadvisable on an HTTP website. Actually, the sign-in button is fake. Um, it's not really on that site. But once the page is there on HTTP, uh, it's easy for an attacker uh, to inject a fake sign-in button that leads to a phishing page. So this is an example of what happens if you try to ever serve any page over HTTP. So we know we need to be encrypted everywhere, the whole web. Um, but the problem with telling people this is we are essentially torturing web developers. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're telling them they have to do this thing, but then if you actually then go and try and do it, you'll end up on a page like this with you know, volume, ch multiple chapters worth of instructions saying, I have to get this certificate signing request, and here go and read the OpenSSL man page to figure out how to make one, and then what do you do with it? And then you have to talk to a certificate authority, and what is a certificate authority, and how do you find one? Um, and, and the one you Google for first will not be a helpful one or whatever. You try to find a free one, it's, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, in fact, um, we did some experiments. I unfortunately don't have time to show you this video, uh, but we, we did some video experiments where we recorded our colleagues who, who had websites uh, attempting to enable HTTPS. Uh, we did this with three of our colleagues on different occasions. Uh, two of them just failed altogether. Um, one of them succeeded, but it took, he's a computer scientist. It took him an hour uh, to get his personal website to be HTTPS. And so if, we, if, if, if even really competent people take that long, uh, we can't expect every web developer to go through this, this process. 
Um, I'm going to skip that video because we don't have time. But, um, and even once you've got your certificate, the configuration options that you're confronted with when, uh, when trying to decide how to arrange your server are mind-boggling. Uh, particularly if you read the news, you see, oh, should I use you know, this Cypher suite this week? Is this one better? This is the history of RC4, which of course went from being disrecommended to briefly recommended as a mitigation against other attacks uh, in old versions of the SSL and TLS protocols, and then went back to being disrecommended. Um, so it, it, unless you're following this stuff for a living, and paying attention, you aren't going to know uh, how to configure a TLS server correctly. It's very complicated. Um, we have things like large parts of the, the client base being requiring SHA-1 for a long time. All the CAs used it, but we know that, well, we have a, an instant messaging window here opening. I better kill that. You back? All right. Um, uh, so we know we have to get rid of this. Um, SHA-1 is insecure. It's probably breakable in the next few years by a, an NSA-type actor. Um, but you know, how are you going to go and reconfigure all your systems to do it? Uh, we need some kind of uh, you know, moment when we switch to SHA-2, uh, SHA-2 SHA v6. But you know, how are we going to get there? Um, and of course, there are all these attacks that keep coming out every, every few uh, months, it seems, there's another serious uh, attack. This one, Logjam, is particularly notable. Um, Logjam uh, appears to have been the reason that there was an NSA slide deck that said, you know, VPNs, we can break them. Uh, HTTPS, SSH, we can break it. Not all of the time, maybe 30% of the time they could break it. It was probably this attack. We don't really know, uh, but it looks like it could have been a method. And so if you had been following a certain set of best practices for Java compatibility and choice of a good Diffie-Hellman group, um, prior to the realization that this attack existed, you would have been vulnerable, perhaps. And then afterwards, those recommendations changed. You now need to make your own Diffie-Hellman groups, which may take a long time. It's several hours to, to generate one and then check everything. And so we, how are we going to tell a million web developers to sit around uh, following this stuff. Um, there is a cool website called uh, the SSL Labs, um, uh, Qualys SSL Labs test page, and um, you can go and point uh, it at your website after you've got TLS deployed, and it'll try and evaluate how good your setup is. But most uh, you know, big websites, or most people <laughs> who deploy this for the first time will get a very low score. Um, and it's only after you then go and read a whole lot more documentation that you can figure out how to get an A plus like we managed to get for Let's Encrypt. Um, but it took us a while, right? We actually had to spend quite a bit of time tuning our configuration. So it's no good to, to tell everyone to do this. You know, you want to drop something like this from Bulletproof SSL in your Cypher suite list. But, you know, how do you know what that is? Um, the next problem that we have is called mixed content blocking. And mixed content blocking is, on one hand, absolutely necessary uh, for a secure web. On the other hand, it's turned out to be a huge problem for deployment. And so an example of what mixed content is, if you go to the Lenovo website, um, it's HTTPS, it looks good, but actually some parts of the page, the, the, the fonts are broken, the CSS is broken, maybe even parts of the page don't work. You open developer tools and you say, why is this? And it turns out that the answer is there were some HTTP uh, scripts and CSS inside an HTTPS page. And the browsers have come to enforce the rule that all the scripts must be the same security level as the page, because if they're not, it defeats the protection. Uh, in the old days, you'd get the crossed out HTTPS, but now they just block it. But that means that many websites like Lenovo or like the New York Times or The Guardian or any you know, news site is going to break as soon as they deploy HTTPS. Um, we actually have a tool you can use, uh, the HTTPS Everywhere client, um, uh, for Firefox and Chrome, um, uh, has a, I think it's just the Chrome version that has this mode, it has a mode where if you're a web developer, you can go to your own site and it'll make suggestions about how to rewrite the uh, script and CSS URLs in your pages to something that will load over HTTPS. So you can, you can fix this. Uh, but you need, to, you need to know about it. Um, it's expert knowledge. Um, there's actually a really cool uh, initiative at the W3C to, uh, that's just created a, a proposed specification for this new uh, form of content security policy header called Upgrade Insecure Requests. So instead of, this says instead of blocking everything that's HTTP, 
in the page and making my Lenovo site break or the New York Times site break. Instead, if you set this header, uh, it'll try the HTTPS version first. So this is much more sensible behavior. It's a pity it's not the default, um, but uh, there is now a way to do this. But once again, we have the problem that how do we tell everyone? There are a million people out there with websites who need to turn this thing on, and that we have no way, I mean, you guys are in this audience paying attention, but we have no way of getting this esoteric information to the people who need it. The next problem, and, and this is uh, one you might have heard us talking about at EFF for a long time, is once you've dealt with all of this stuff, you have a beautiful, secure website, uh, it's not actually that secure. Um, this is part of a map uh, that we generated in 2010 by port scanning the whole internet. We port scanned all of IPv4 address space on port 443 and said, hey, are you there? Is there a machine there? If so, uh, we tried to do a TLS handshake and we saw what certificate we got back. And then we e examined all of those certificates to see um, how many certificate authorities were able to sign a valid certificate that a, a copy of Firefox or Internet Explorer or something would accept. And we thought that we were going to find maybe 50 or 100 of these certificate authorities. But actually, it turned out there were thousands of them um, run by hundreds of organizations. And you, you might say, well, how is that possible? I, I opened Firefox and I looked at the list and there were only you know, 66. But they're actually able to delegate or cross-sign their authority to other organizations, and they do this quite a lot. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but as a result, there's this huge number of CAs uh, that can uh, issue for any domain, like google.com, addons.mozilla.org, debian.org, any of these names, a thousand, organization, a thousand CAs can sign a certificate for debian.org. Uh, and then uh, that means that there are a thousand places in the world or more that you can hack to get a certificate for debian.org. Now, we flagged this as a theoretical problem back when we got these results, but actually it turned out to be a real problem. Um, for instance, a recent example, uh, this Chinese certificate authority that everyone had been worried about um, had actually, it didn't itself issue a malicious certificate, it issued a, a subordinate cross-signature to another CA, which in turn attacked uh, Google, uh, and Google noticed. But uh, there was also the DigiNotar incident in uh, the Netherlands, where a Dutch CA was compromised. They were used to attack Gmail users in Iran for, uh, for over a month, and you know, order of 300,000 people had their usernames and passwords compromised uh, by some Iranian-related attack. Um, so this system is structurally insecure. There are too many certificate authorities. So I'm going to talk about our vision for a solution. Um, and you know, the first thing I'm going to say is it needs to be a solution for, of two thoughts. It needs to be a solution for security, and also it needs to be a solution for usability. We need, we've come to learn that there's no such thing, in fact, as security that isn't usable, because it's great to have a computer which theoretically um, has the correct properties, but humans are actually parts of our systems too, and if the humans are, get confused or don't know how to use the system correctly, then in, in deployment, the, si the system will be compromised. Uh, by, by either technical or human uh, methods. So, getting back to this question of too many CAs, you know, our solution to that problem is to launch one more CA. Um, um, uh, and I sort of jest, and I don't. I mean, essentially, our reasoning here is we'll do one more, we'll get it right this time, um, or much closer to right than anyone else has done so far. Uh, and then we can worry about the problem of you know, what to do about structural insecurity from the other ones. Uh, there are some ideas about that. I'll talk about them later. But first, let's talk about how to do one correctly. Um, the big question you have to answer for security when you issue a certificate um, is, should you do it at all? Um, how do you decide if a particular person who comes and asks, you know, a Debian sysadmin comes and asks for a certificate for some domain, do we give it to them or not? Um, our solution uh, involves, you know, it's a little bit like a scene from Monty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail. Um, you know, the, 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 the sysadmin or the system comes along and says, you know, please give me a certificate. And the CA says back, well, all right, bring me a shrubbery. Um, and, uh, and then maybe they, you know, the, the, the system goes off and finds a shrubbery and comes back with it. And then it says, oh, it's a nice shrubbery, but actually I want another one, like uh, another different shrubbery next to it. Uh, and so we have uh, 
a conversation a little bit like this happening in a protocol that's being standardized at the IETF called ACME. Um, and the shrubberies are challenges in this ACME protocol. Uh, and so the protocol can contain many different kinds of challenges. Uh, I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, and so this is, this is an architecture for, 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 for verification of domains. Um, but fundamentally, because there is no prior crypto in most cases, we are trying to figure out how to do encryption for the first time. We have to know what key to use, and we have no cryptographic authority to begin with. So we're going to have to bootstrap that somehow. And the way this currently works, if you've, you, how many people here have gotten a certificate from a CA before? How many people have not? Few more yeses than noes, but you're, you're a mixture. So those of you who have have probably had this experience that um, you go to a CA, you say, give me a certificate today, and they send an email to, your to some special email address, like root or webmaster or ad admin at your domain name. That's the common one. Then you have to click on a link in that email, and then you're done. Well, you're not done, but you ha you've done with ver ver verification. You still have to pay money and, and deal with bureaucracy, but that's the only validation they do. A small number of CAs also support this other kind of va validation where you put up a special nonce file uh, on your domain name over HTTP. Um, so we're going to do something that's, in some sense, quite similar uh, to these methods. Um, the ones we're going to support at launch is a thing called DVSNI. Um, how many people here know what SNI is? Yeah, so for the other people, SNI is an addition to the TLS or SSL protocol that was added um, to solve a, a, a structural layering problem where um, prior to the existence of this method, uh, the client would just say, I want to talk TLS, and the server would come back with a certificate, and then you could speak HTTPS over the TLS connection, and then in the HTTPS session, you'd have a, a host header saying what domain name you wanted. And that, that old arrangement was completely incompatible with virtual hosting because the server didn't know what domain name you wanted until after you'd already started speaking TLS and accepted the certificate. But the client needs to know what, uh, uh, the client needs to inspect the domain name in the certificate before it can start speaking TLS. And so the server's stuck, it doesn't know which name, uh, which of its many virtually hosted domain names to give a certificate for. So th there was this addition to the protocol that lets the client say, I want, to talk to this particular name, and then the server can pick the certificate, come back. We use this channel in a different, uh, uh, you know, novel way. We ask the the, the, the web server to configure some uh, fictitious uh, SNI names, not the ones you're actually serving, but special, alt like like weird, non-existent ones, and we verify that you can put up a uh, special certificate on those non-existent SNI names. Um, and the purpose of doing this is to essentially request that the, uh, in the you know, in the challenge, that the, the client prove that it controls the Apache configuration or the Nginx configuration or whatever server configuration you have on that box. Um, and so just being a, you know, ordinary user will not be good enough. You need to have www user access or root access, depending on the system, whatever it is that lets you reconfigure Apache, you can pass this challenge. The other one we'll support is simple, this simple HTTP thing, which is a little bit um, weaker. That's like uh, the nonce we had uh, at that domain. Uh, it's a little bit weaker, but it should be easier for people who are behind uh, proxies or um, CDNs. So they, they can put up a file behind the proxy or the CDN. So at launch, we're planning to have these two, uh, and, and we'll, we'll compare them in deployment, see how they work. Uh, later on, we're planning to allow, support DNS validation, so if you have a huge infrastructure and you want to just do validation in one place, you can sp put up a magic text record. Um, what we're also planning to support a faster and more secure version of this DVSNI thing, where you want to have a thousand uh, names virtually hosted on a server, you can do one single uh, DVSNI2 connection to us, um, and basically you say, we, we say, make these 100 different uh, virtual hosts, um, and then we pick five or six of them randomly and validate those five or six randomly. Uh, and then we know that you probably did all uh, 100 because statistically you couldn't have guessed which five we were going to validate. Um, and that way we can basically be confident that if you ask us for a thousand names, we do one TCP connection, we're convinced you're serving all of them. But so all of these methods, th this is what we're going to support on day one. 
uh, and these are the things we're going to support later. But all of these methods are fundamentally terrifying. Uh, if, you, if you're building a giant robot to issue certificates for the whole web, uh, what you're doing with these things is you're saying, I'm going to fling some TCP packets down a dark corridor, and I'm going to listen to the message that comes back, and I'm going to believe it. Um, and I don't know what monsters lurk in that dark corridor. I don't know if there's a hacked router. I don't know if there's a hacked DNS server. If there is, I'm going to be fooled by it. Um, and so this is a problem. We aren't quite in this worst case scenario. We can do slightly better uh, by doing multiple paths. So rather than just validating from one dark corridor, we can start in several places on the internet and uh, try to connect to the server. And if we get the same answer back from all of them, then we know that uh, it isn't at least, you know, if there's a hacked router, it can't just be anywhere. It has to either be very close to the, the victim or someone very good, someone who's so good that they're able to compromise our routers all over the internet. Uh, and so we re significantly reduce the attack surface for uh, breaking domain validation. But this is still not good enough, actually. We're still, we, we still wouldn't be satisfied launching a, a big robot to, in, to do authentication for the whole web if non-cryptographic attacks um, would allow us to, for instance, be used to compromise a bank, in, a small bank in some country or a corporate webmail system somewhere. Um, so we really should try to, to protect against this. And fortunately, we can do better. So I mentioned before the SSL Observatory, where we port scanned all of the public internet. We also have a decentralized SSL Observatory through uh, our Firefox, HTTPS, everywhere users. They can opt into sending us certificates. So we have this, and we have certificate transparency from Google. We have these giant databases of all the certificates on the web now. Uh, and so we can use these, uh, both the centralized and decentralized ones, um, to sometimes demand a different kind of shrubbery, not just a domain validation challenge, but we can say, oh, we see from our database that there is a current existing valid certificate for your you know, small corporate webmail system or your bank. And so actually, please prove to us that you possess the private key uh, from that certificate that already exists. And so that way, an attacker who can compromise a router can't come and use us to attack someone who already has a certificate. Um, now, um, so this, this is really good, but it, you'll, you may notice that there are some potential usability problems. If you've already purchased a certificate and then you lost it, your hard disk crashed, you don't have the certificate anymore, um, you're going to get this demand from us saying, bring us the shrubbery, bring us a proof of the private key, but you don't have it anymore. Um, so what we will do in this case, uh, you know, we won't be able to issue to you, but there is an escape path, which is you go back to a CA, one of the existing CAs, and you pay them money, and they do the, the, the manual ver verification. They call you on the phone, whatever it is. Um, you pay, the, you pay for, for a new certificate, then you can come back and run our automated client again, and you can pass the proof of possession challenge with your new cert. So uh, there is this idea of, uh, you know, in the theory of uh, authentication on the internet of, of tofu, trust on first use. You're probably all familiar with this idea from SSH, where SSH didn't have any of this nonsense with certificates. Um, and what we're able to do here is basically get back the security, the type of security that you get with SSH, um, but deploy it in a place where it was never really deployable uh, before, which is web servers, email servers, um, servers where the people who are connecting to the server don't know the sysadmin that controls it. So, you know, you couldn't do SSH for, for, for the web because if you ever got that weird SSH error message with the wrong key, how would you know if you should click yes or if you should uh, abort because you're under attack? You know, with SSH, usually you just call the person who owns the server or you are the person who owns the server and so you know the right answer. But with HTTPS, you know, it, th that model wouldn't have worked. But here, with us in the middle, we basically get to function this way. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we'll also be able to solve a lot of these problems that people have with deploying uh, HTTPS and TLS and configuring it correctly. And the idea is to produce, you don't, obviously Debian users don't need to, to use this, but if you want to, um, we'll pr produce a client or a rich client or an agent that you run on your servers uh, that knows how to configure your, uh, your Cypher settings and everything else on a dynamic basis and just do it right. 
And so rather than having millions of web developers out there and we're telling them all, you need to be experts on security, you need to know everything, you need to follow the news, uh, deprecate this, change this every day, um, we can have a much smaller group of people who work with us, you know, basically on GitHub and come and, and tweak the code and we can put in uh, good solutions, uh, maybe a couple of good solutions. There's a maximum security mode and there's a maximum compatibility mode. We, we, we focus our energies on these two things and then we can deploy that out to a million people uh, and their websites uh, via the agent. Um, so the plan uh, for the default, this default client is it, it, when you run it, it will tweak your server uh, it'll use Apache or Nginx, or in fact, it can use any server. It has a little plugin API, so you can write a, uh, a plugin to do Dovecart or XM or Postfix or uh, your XMPP daemon or your ISC daemon, anything you want. Um, um, you can have these, um, these plugins configured to pass the challenges, pass, you know, bring shrubberies to the CA. Um, you can have them just accept a certificate once the challenge is passed, so probably for your IRC daemon, we're not going to validate anything of IRC, so you use port 443 to get the certificate, but then you can have a plugin go in and take it and install it in your IRC daemon. Um, and then it can also tweak the security options inside that uh, server to, to ha follow current best practices. Um, and then, of course, the other thing you'll know if you've deployed HTTPS is renewal is a giant pain. Just as soon as you've uh, you know, it, it, it's so complicated getting a cert, and you figure out how to do it, and then about 11, 12 months later, you've completely forgotten, and then your certificate expires, and your site goes down. Um, so we're able to automate renewal for the certificates, and we, maybe we can also automate even some of the um, more, uh, more interesting, well, sort of more uh, predictable security response tasks. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. So. Um, automation comes in different, f f f for these protocols, comes in a spectrum of, of difficulty. There's easy stuff, like tuning the ciphers, um, turning on OTSP stapling so people can tell if your certificate is revoked or not, um, doing the upgrade insecure thing for mixed content that I mentioned before. Those you can just turn on. We're just going to be able to turn it on for everyone. These are obviously good ideas. They don't have any real downsides. Um, so they're good defaults. There are some things where we're going to have to hold the hand of the sysadmin a little bit more. We can't just charge in and do a redirect to HTTPS because for some clients, the mixed content blocking will become a problem if you just redirect and things will break. And so we need to you know, maybe turn this on but then tell the admin, hey, go and check that everything's working okay and then here's how you wind it back if you turned on something that was broken. Renewal is a little bit tricky to get right. I think we've actually got a pretty good implementation of that. Harder stuff uh, is doing full rewriting for all clients um, or HSTS, which is a really important security um, header that you absolutely need to set. No one does right now, or very few domains do. But the, one of the reasons why people don't set it is because uh, not just they don't know about it, but if you set it and you get it wrong, it breaks your website. It, ha it, ha it has this very strong set of security properties and it has a time to live. And if, if they're violated before the time to live is done, then the site is just down, the user will get a big red, red everything that they can't click through. So it, it requires a lot of care uh, before you turn this on. The hardest things, um, uh, one of them is HPKP or pinning, which is a, the solution to the problem of there being hundreds of CAs. There's now a header you can set which says, from now on, for, you know, for the next two months, three months, six months, you do not accept a certificate from any CA except what, you know, the two or three that I name here. The problem with doing that is if you accidentally violate it, you, you know, your CA you, starts costing too much or you stop doing business, business with them, whatever, again, you have a, an, un, a, 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 like an unrecoverable error. Or if you ever serve the wrong HPKP header on your site, you're completely, completely screwed. So this stuff needs to be done very carefully. Um, it's also possible to do what, what we call mixed content auditing, where we use the content security policy to cause clients to send a message to servers if they see a, an HTTP script or image inside or, or, or CSS inside an HTTPS page. But that's tricky because we need a place to, to put up a server for you. It would be a little bit crazy for our agent to start running new web services on your servers without uh, you having configured them. Uh, so at some point, we may be able to do this kind of stuff, automating, fixing these problems, uh, but it's going to be hardest. But um, so, so having done all of this, 
it, it just remains the case that operating a robot to authenticate the entire web is terrifying. It's this giant machine that uh, could get hacked, it could go wrong, and if it does, it'll have terrible security conference, uh, consequences for a lot of people. And so we need to uh, protect ourselves and, and you guys uh, as much as possible when we launch. Uh, so we want to both defend in depth, have multiple layers of protection against compromise, but also have very good plans to detect if we ever get hacked and to make sure that that hack uh, doesn't cause a persistent problem. We always have a way to recover pretty quickly if something goes wrong. Um, so in terms of, of transparency, uh, we have three big thing w things we're going to do. Um, one is we're going to publish all the logs of the ACME protocol stuff that happens. So if someone comes to us and asks for a certificate, we're going to publish a record of what IP address they came from, what, what challenges we gave back to them, what happened when we ran those challenges, uh, what the conclusion was. So you guys, anyone who's interested, can watch our live stream of, of what we're doing and audit it and help us to catch uh, problems if they're occurring or attacks if people are trying them. Um, then. At the output level, once we've decided, yes, you get to have a certificate, we're going to publish every certificate we issue in a verifiable way. So they're going to have a portion of the serial number that is strictly incrementing, and then a signature on every certificate over the incrementing number, so that actually functions like a blockchain. Basically, there'll be a, a public record that you can inspect. This is the complete history of all Let's Encrypt certificates. If there's anything in that history that shouldn't exist, um, you can see it, and if you ever have a certificate that doesn't have the serial number and the signature, you know it's malicious. Um, we're also going to publish this um, uh, to the certificate transparency logs run by Google and other people. Um, we'll give you a way if you want to only use us and, and not the whole 500 other, 1,000 other CAs to turn on this pinning stuff if you're brave and, and crazy. Um, uh, and I think it'll be a good idea for sites that have a fa fairly high level of operational sophistication, but we'll still want that to be a thoroughly buried power user feature until it's very uh, well tested. Um, uh, we also plan to, uh, to try to implement a feature that doesn't exist for, for current CAs, which is the server, the CA itself, should be able to send a message to clients, your web server, um, showing, hey, we've spotted a problem with your cert or with your key. Maybe there's an attack against your server, it's Heartbleed, or there's a, a weak key on your machine, or in the worst case, w we've been compromised. Our, our subordinate intermediate CA has been compromised. We're going to have to revoke your certificate. But we'll tell you uh, 12 to 24 hours in advance. So you can ping us over OCSP and see um, are you about to, to reissue this, require re reissuance or rekeying of this cert? If you are, then your client on your, on your server can just do that automatically for you uh, without your pager having to go off. Uh, and this means that where current CAs, if they're compromised, it's just a disaster because all these websites go down. Uh, with us, we should be able to have a plan to roll over really fast to a different set of keys, a different set of hardware. Um, or when we see a lot of compromised machines, we can help them get fixed really fast. Um, so this project, as I mentioned, is a collaboration. Originally, EFF and the University of Michigan had a project. Mozilla had a project. The two merged together. Um, we're also uh, getting sponsorship from Cisco and Akamai, uh, Identrust, Automatic, and some other people, I think, on the way. The project is housed in a new nonprofit called ISRG, the Internet Security Research Group. Uh, EFF is working mostly on the client code, uh, the agent software that can run on, on, on OSs like Debian and on the server, um, which is written in Go, it's called Boulder. Uh, Mozilla and ISRG are mostly in charge of the, uh, the, s the actual servers and the CA operations. Everyone's working on the bureaucracy. Um, the schedule has slipped slightly from what we first announced, but it's still pretty close. Uh, so we'll be issuing a first set around the 7th of September. Um, there'll be a validity uh, a public, the, those certs will become valid and there'll be a, a beta that some people can participate in publicly from around mid-October and then everyone can use it from mid-November. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're dealing with a lot of audit and bureau uh, like both technical and, and paperwork bureaucracy and also coding away on GitHub. We'd love your help. We have three repos, the spec, the client and the server written in Go. Um, and 
uh, you can help us encrypt the web. Now, I have a little bit of time. I'm going to try and show you guys a, a super quick demo uh, of this thing in action. So can everyone read this font? Is it big enough? OK. Uh, so I, I'm going to just do that to reset everything to start of demo state. And then let's, uh, let's open a new little uh, window. So I have a test website here, very simple, um, just HTTP. And then I also I have two of these. Here's a fancier website. It's a bit like the New York Times website uh, or something with a lot of fancy content on it. Um, uh, it has uh, some embedded JavaScript um, that causes ponies to dance around when they load. Um, here we go. Um, <laughs> Um, and so over here in this, in, on this server, um, we can run the Let's Encrypt client. And we'll just put it in vermbos mode. And let's ask for a redirect. And here we go. So uh, it figures out what names you're serving. Um, and here it's asking for strawberries. And then it's going to go and get them. And where previously, uh, doing this took about an hour. Um, now we're done. So let's see how this works. We don't have the read. Ah, oh, yes, here we go. We have a redirect, uh, and we're HTTPS. This is not actually valid. I had to add our, our test CA into the browser, so you can't get a live cert yet. Uh, but it'll be live in mid-October. Um, but we still have some problems here. Uh, so I, I mentioned HSTS before. Uh, if we reload this page, we look at the network requests. Wow, this is actually hard to do with such a small screen. Um, uh, OK, network. I'm sorry, I'm not actually going to be able to show you. Basically, what, what you have here is you'll still have a, a single HTTP request that's hijackable. Because even though we're redirecting, the, the client doesn't know there's a redirect until it sends all its cookies and everything over HTTP and gets told to go to HTTPS. Um, and on the uh, other fancier website, uh, things are also not going so well. Because when we go to HTTPS, uh, mixed content blocking has kicked in. And so we have no ponies. Um, this is really sad. Now the user could get the ponies if they were gonna if they knew that this little shield here, um, let's, they can click on it and ask for ponies and insecurity. But that's not good. It, like like we don't like users don't even see that thing. Um, so um, we can also support uh, secure mode. Uh, and here, this is the version where we're willing to take some risks. We're willing to turn on some uh, fancier, more experimental uh, uh, security features. It's going to take another 20 seconds. It's getting its shrubberies. OK, and this time, you probably ca you won't be able to see it, but this time there was, um, especially on the second load, there is no longer an HTTP request that's made. It now goes straight to HTTPS because of the HSTS header that's been set. And then if we go to the, uh, the fancier website, um, this time, let's reload it, the upgrade insecure header has been set. And so even though the page contains an HTTP list of ponies, the client is told by this header to upgrade the request. And so now the New York Times or whatever website, Lenovo can have their ponies. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. Is there any questions? If you have questions, OK, I'll just pass the microphone. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much. I have a PhD in computer security, and my colo, my own personal website, is not using TLS for all these reasons. And I, I'm just so glad that you are wading through this swamp for me. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. Uh, what about what about email certificates? 
So uh, do you mean S-MIME or do you mean IMAP, SMTPS? Both. <laughs> so um, for pretty early on, we'll be able to support the, um, the IMAP, POP, and um, uh, SMTP cases. Those are, you know, w you can use our current software to just obtain a certificate and then you can copy it into your configuration. But you can also write a plugin for, in fact, we're hoping that people will write a few plugins for the common um, free mail clients um, that, uh, uh, sorry, free mail servers, uh, both the SMTP kinds and IMAP and POP, that know how to automatically deploy to Postfix, to XM, uh, to Dovecot, et cetera. Uh, on the MIME front, that will be separate engineering on the server side, uh, and we, we are going to focus on getting uh, TLS done correctly uh, and, and working correctly before we think about whether SMIME is the next step, but it might happen. Hey, um, thanks for doing that. Um, let's encrypt with like a cool project that pushes the web further, um, but I got some questions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like one of the guys behind Tor and CJDN as an alternative uh, routing protocols mm -hmm. where like statistics win and DNS is not the issue for um, the certification behind, right? And um, will there be support for like CJDNS and Tor for, um, with my first question? And then the second question would be like, if there would be like the possibility to have like certificates that are, ano that are anonymous and not traceable so that people can host anonymous website without being traced by the government or so. Mm -hmm. So um, there are multiple cases in there. Uh, I think that uh, the first feature that I want to implement uh, that's Tor related is a dash dash Tor flag for this client, which knows how to go and conf make a hidden service that maps to your existing website. And so you are a public server, you're speaking uh, TLS on the public web, so you don't have this confidentiality thing, but you want to be, you want censorship resistant routing to your service. So people who might uh, be subject to DNS censorship or whatever can come and connect to you uh, over Tor. And so, you know, initially we'll probably use .onion. We've also been talking to the Tor development community about other, you know, things that might be a little bit faster than all six hops of, of Onion routing. Uh, in terms of pure .onion certificates and whether we can, um, we, whether we can do a completely anonymous certificate for a .onion name, um, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I know that the rules in the, the current club of CAs have made up cu would currently, the ones that they wrote for themselves before we get to join the club, uh, require EV, what's called an EV certificate for a .onion. And so under those rules, unless we can change them, we won't be able to issue you a .onion set because we won't be doing EV. Uh, EV requires that you actually know the company at the other end, you inspect their records, et cetera. But I make the, other, the next following observation. Because Tor controls its own client, you know, the Tor browser bundle is not Google or Apple or Microsoft or Mozilla, if you want to use our code and, and generate a separate signing authority that's just for .onions and then put it in the root list for, um, for Tor browser bundle, there's actually no reason not to do that. Uh, yourselves. Hi, um, my name is Andrzej Suri and I co-chair the Dame Working Group. And uh, just out of the curiosity, I heard a lot of crap from certification authorities that they have a blacklist of names like paypal.com, so they don't issue DV certificates for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have opinion on that. Well, I have, but not related to this. Uh, do you plan to address this as well or not? Yeah, so we, in our current code base, I think we block the Alexa top something, 100,000 or something, and it, it, so that's in our source code, and if anyone from one of those domains wants to use us, they can come and send us a pull request to remove the block for, for, their, um, for their particular domain name in the, the server source code, because it's on Git. Uh, GitHub, so you can just say, okay, we're, we're Wikipedia, we want to be unblocked from issuance, here's our pull request, you can talk to us, we'll approve your pull request, and then it, you'll be unblocked. We also effectively do this for many more than the Alexa Top 1000 with this, the proof of possession challenge that I described. Because all of those high security uh, sites have current valid certificates, if you try to use uh, Let's Encrypt for one of those domains, you're gonna get a proof of possession challenge. We're only gonna give you a cert if you can show that you hold the key from a, a, a current valid one. So uh, yes, we're actually gonna do uh, something quite similar to that. Yep, DKG. 
Hi, uh, so thank you for working on this. I'm really excited to see this happening. Um, I noticed that you're, I, I guess I have questions about your approach towards HPKP. Mm -hmm. um, the way you framed it, you uh, are looking mainly at HPKP for uh, pinning the authorities. Mm -hmm. But another approach, if you have control of the server itself, is that you can pin uh, the end entity certs and make backup certs um, mm -hmm. in, some, in some other secure area uh, so that you can actually work without the certificate authority pinning itself. So have you considered that mode? Uh, um, we haven't, and if you think you have a good story about how uh, an integrated version of that could be implemented um, in, in, in a way that basically is like prepackaged for a certain like category of sysadmins, uh, please come and implement it. We, sh we should be giving you a, a nice easy framework to add a command line flag that's like, you know, private HPKP mode, that, you know, you, you can tell people to, to add that flag and get that particular experience. Hi, uh, thanks for working on all of this. Um, I had a question about sort of privacy. So uh, because you mentioned that all these domains will be published to your own log and separately certificate transparency, is there a way to have some of these domains not be published absolutely immediately, like maybe a day-ish later? Uh, or at the not request published? of the domain? Yeah. Uh, we don't currently plan to do differential, like, Log, log log pipelines. I think we'd want to see a really uh, we, we would one need to see a really clear story about why that was worth engineering, uh, and then two, um, we'd need to be convinced that that was the most important thing to spend development resources on, because um, it's you know it's hard enough to build a reliable pipeline, and then having a reliable pipeline with two different speeds in it is trickier still. So. I might be willing to do some of the engineering work on that, so yeah. we can talk about that. I mean, the, the problem you get is that having holes in your list of, like, in your blockchain, basically, um, requires people to tolerate a blockchain that's constantly, in a, like, full of holes. Um, and maybe you can bound those and say, well, you can verify up to yesterday, but you can't verify today. Uh, but, um, <laughs> uh, the, no, but the question is why, really? Yeah, sure. Tell tell us why you you would like this. Sorry, it's always me. Um, right. So this is for Sandstorm, which is uh, another web app package manager we'll be talking about on Thursday. But we run each user session of an app on a one-time use subdomain. So if those subdomains, if those We'd like to have HTTPS for all of those, and we'd love to use Let's Encrypt, and we'd love for everyone in the world to be running their own Sandstorm server with Let's Encrypt HTTPS. And those sessions can be short, like a day. Uh, and, and just merely knowing one of these things is, is a security problem if they're known. Yeah, they're used for, um, they're used for avoiding cross-site request forgery attacks. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you have, a, normally you don't have a session ID cookie with a well-known host name of an app, but here you have an a uh, rare, an unknowable, an un unguessable rather, uh, host name for the app, and so this defangs cross-site request forgery attacks. I think in the long run, I mean, the, obviously the thing you want is wildcard certs, and we aren't going to offer them at first. Maybe one day we will. Who knows? But but not at first. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't use really a different CA until we're ready to help you. <laughs> we can't solve every problem sim simultaneously, unfortunately. Hi. Uh, um Web ID TLS uh, needs uh, different uh, subject alternative names than uh, than the host name, so mm -hmm. it needs a, a URL instead. Mm -hmm. So it's supported by the the, uh, the CLS uh, what certificate protocol. But what do, could, would you uh, support issuing certificates that has uh, subject alternative names that is, are not only host names but also, also URLs? What was the protocol that you mentioned? Uh, Web ID plus TLS. Uh -huh. Well, I think um, that's the kind of thing that, in principle, we think CA, you know, uh, RCA should support if protocols need weird things. It's also the kind of thing that we, we need to look at really closely and have people audit before we add it to the code base. So um, uh, send, us a pull, you know, send us a bolder pull request um, if you can, implementing the kinds of validation that that protocol needs. Uh, and in the long run, we may be able to do it. Okay, so one last question. 
Hey, you want to have a question? No. Yes, I might have missed that, but how did you convince uh, Google for Chrome and Microsoft to uh, include your root certificate? Mm. Great and question. Will, are you sure that it will remain there for longer? Great question. So uh, I, I sh I, I, there's actually a slide missing from this particular version of this talk, which is, what do you need to do to become a certificate authority? Um, and I did have the giant pile of paperwork there, which is like a, a crucial piece of this is the giant pile of paperwork. But, uh, and you need to pass these audits and things. But one of the things you might think you need to do is get into the trust roots of Microsoft and Apple and Mozilla and Google operates one for Android. Um, the answer is you don't need to get into the trust roots. Um, you, there was a lot of drama, for instance, when CNNIC, the Chinese certificate authority, was added to the Mozilla trust route. And of course, we, we saw in the slides that that actually turned out to be a bad idea in the end. Um, but actually, CNNIC had been trusted by browsers for a year or two before it was added to the Mozilla route because of cross signatures. Uh, so uh, it turns out all you need to do is to persuade another CA to cross sign you, and now you're trusted by the browsers. And the browsers themselves don't get to decide straightforwardly whether they trust you or not. It happens automatically. Um, so uh, we were able to announce this project basically on the day that we had a contract signed with Identrust uh, for a cross signature. It was contingent on us passing the same audit that all the other CAs passed. Uh, but once, once we had that contract signed and they were committed to cross signing us when we were ready, uh, then it didn't matter whether Microsoft said yes or no or later. It didn't matter whether Mozilla said yes or no or later. Um, what we needed was that contract. Sorry. Um, so Peter will be here for the rest of the evening. He has yep. to unfortunately go tomorrow morning, but he's here, so you can talk to him. Um, and sorry for running a bit over time, but now we're uh, up for dinner. So thanks, Peter, yep. again. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for great questions. I will add on that last point. It, we will get at it. We will at get ourselves added to those lists. It just isn't the thing that actually matters.